my experience with uh, intracranial stenting has started from last uh, 10 to 12 years but uh, for last from uh, 2012 to almost 2020 i had very little work in intracranial stenting so after i got my new cath lab i really started doing this work for last two years i've been doing it quite frequently so can i share the screen now yeah Here we are. <clears throat> Gigi, sir, I joined. Hello, Jay. Uh, I don't think he has joined, sir. It's okay, sir. We can start. I shall uh, tell him. It's okay, sir. Okay. We can start. Fine. So, this image, even if uh, we have done numbers, give me still goose flesh. Because when you're entering intracranial artery and there is a stenosis, there are high chances of. Uh, problems which which may be experienced in different ways so i have been i have been given this uh, topic of how i do it so i believe uh, it is uh, more about how to avoid complications so your work environment definitely does matter and uh, if you're Team, if you have a team spirit and you know all people that people around, and if they're working working with you for few years, then chances of complications become less. So it is very important that you get trained in a proper way and train people with you for making things happen in your your way. So for intracranial stenting anatomy of the circulation should be very, very clear. So you should have a good high-end machine for doing these cases. And it is, uh, it is every time necessary that whenever you do a case and if you have any doubt, it is always, to dis it is always better to discuss with colleague whom you know and whom you know is very good in skills and understanding. There is no hesitancy about that. And you should be very comfortable in your workplace. So now, if you see the current status of intracranial stenting worldwide, it is so far no good. We know that there is a documented complication rate of about 70 to 8 percent in the first one month. So question is how to get it down to minimum and how to foresee complications and avoid disasters. So we'll come to a short uh, understanding of intracranial atherosclerotic disease. You see a stenotic carotid in cervical region and you know what to do about it. But when you see a cavernous carotid stenosis as a neurologist, you are really uh, thinking of how to manage this case. So many patients, even on optical ma optimal medical management, do get a stroke. So they should be focused on, and these patients should be followed up very regularly because they may develop a stroke. And especially in Asians, in our population, intracranial disease is very common. So what are the complications that occur with intracranial stenting? So just to summarize few major complications is local hematoma that is with most often femoral sheath. 
sometimes there is pseudo, there is a pseudo aneurysm so i think all of you must be knowing how to manage it about systemic complications dissection is a very important complication because you want to have an access if you don't have an access and if you don't go with your access catheter as distally as possible close to the stenosis tracking the stent is very very difficult second we don't have a dedicated as such embolic protection device right now for intracranial disease so we do a balloon plasty or we put a stent directly so there is a possibility that an unstable plaque may throw an embolus into the distal territory vasospasm is another problem where uh, you direct ducts into the distal vascular territories and the spasm occurs so the common strategy is to give nimodepin for initial 10 to 15 minutes prepare your material take some time and then take a shoot and once there is a effect of nimodepin on arterial tree then you can really start manipulating so waiting period of 10 to 15 minutes before you really go into say c1 bend or ophthalmic bend is very very important bleed or rupture is a disaster and uh, we'll discuss later on how to manage it or prevent it wire perforation was very much significant in sampris trial so how to handle wire is also very very important and hyperperfusion syndrome just like carotid can occur with intracranial disease do it is rare and then you can have stent occlusion and antiplatelet resistance etc so you have to carefully plan and foresee these complications in each and every individual case so before any case what i do is i speak with relatives understand them understand from where they come from and what is their attitude and make them understand what are the complications and if you don't do the procedure what is likely to happen and if if most of them agree i would go ahead with uh, my plan so it is very important that discussion with relatives in detail should be done in each and every case because attitude of uh, relatives may differ and they may prefer to continue medical treatment so we have to give importance to that whenever there is a a situation where i feel that uh, this is going to be a dicey or there there is going to be some technical problem i always discuss with my colleagues and you should ask yourself that by doing this procedure whether i am going to make a positive impact in patient's life so that is very very important so just before we go into technical part i would just like to show you uh, an illustrative case which i have done recently and uh, how i manage this cases so this is an old this is a old gentleman who had recurrent strokes two years ago on left side he had hemiparesis but he was able to walk and he was on the antiplatelet statins and then he developed recurrent episodes of right hemiparesis so this is a diffusion weighted mr which shows a small infarct in left parietal region you can see old changes of uh, gliosis involving both border zones and the uh, right occipital cortex so you can uh, clearly see that the arch is bovine and i knew that i will have difficulty in putting the 
even diagnostic in the distal CCA. So this is his intracranial angiogram. It shows that there is severe petrous ICS stenosis. You can see it here. And right IC is occluded. And both ACAs are likely uh, feeling from the left ICA. So we went ahead with uh, angiogram, which shows that there is a bovine arch. There is a severe, more than 80% stenosis of petrous ICA and some atherosclerosis, again involving of, of helmic segment, which is about 40 to 50%. So with information from DSA, I knew that there will be difficulty from transfemoral root. So I chose radial. So we have put six French radial sheath here. And it is petrous. So access is not going to be much of a problem. So I decided to use just six French envoy catheter. So this is what we do. We don't intubate the patient. We just use IGL2, which is uh, just sits at the glottis and ventilates the patient with GA so that there is no pain or blood pressure fluctuations while intubating or extubating the patient. And extubation is very, very comfortable. So this is my setup that I uh, pronate the wrist and keep the catheters on the platform, which I've made by myself. So this is NY going in. And if you can appreciate that there is a four French glide cat with RAV shape, which is particularly suited for left carotid. So I'm tracking the envoy. This is a roadmap. This is the lesion. So next step is proper measurements of the lesion. So, <clears throat> Recently, I had very tortuous anatomy. So uh, routine stent, including Onyx, was not tracking. And I had used this cruise stent, which is an Indian-made company. So I have used a cruise stent here, 4.5 by 20. The artery was measuring 4.75, so 0.25 less. And then you put it across. And then you literally say, one, two, three, four while inflation till the device opposes to the artery well. So this is a balloon angioplasty and direct stenting because stent would track because stenosis is just 80%. This is the post stenting angiogram. So now you can remove the whole system. We generally wait for about 30 minutes for to, uh, to check whether there, how is the flow in the stent or whether there is any complication or stent associated thrombosis. And this is the final shoe. This looks well. And for radial, remember that wire should always be in the catheter because there may be radial artery spasm and there will be some resistance while pulling the guiding catheter out. So now I'll just show how easy it is to extubate the patient. I 
This is uh, the cheap method of uh, removing radial artery puncture. Just use a gauze and then use a Dyna Plus pressure piercing. So here is extubation. This IGL sits in the glottis, not in the trachea. Now he is awake. So, this is in just short how it is done. And the beauty of radial is that patient immediately can sit, can walk, and uh, here he is. So, this, is, this was just an illustrative case of how it can be done. So, now, uh, little about anatomy. The common atherosclerotic sites are petrous ICA, cavernous ICA, ophthalmic or clinoid portion, and uh, you have to be very careful of whether the stenosis involves the perforator segments and uh, is PCOM or anterior choroidal involved in the clinoidal segment. So M1 and A1 have perforators. So you have to do a detailed angiogram to understand how are the perforator origins. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, a tool for assessing the origin of these perforators. But I think in future with IVUS or maybe OCT, this may happen. So again, anatomy of vertebral extra pyramidal part, V1 segment then intraforaminal, then C2 to C1 until it enters the dura, and then the V4 segment. And in basilar, there are mid perforators in the mid basilar portion. So you have to be very careful about uh, whether they have uh, stenotic lesions at the origin before planning any stenting in mid basilar portion, or uh, if the stenosis is involving ICA, PICA, or SCA, you have to be very careful. So what are the indications according to me? So somebody who has asymptomatic stenosis of more than 90% with poor collateral flow. So let's see this case. This gentleman had come with recurrent episodes of unconsciousness. He would lie unconscious, when he was walking or upright and after lying down for five to 10 minutes, he would become conscious. So what has happened that both vertebro basilar junctions are diseased. You can see that the left vertebral is dominant. On MR angiogram, we cannot assess whether it is occlusion or stenosis. So this is a hemodynamic problem and uh, it is very likely that it will respond to stenting. So on DSA, you always check a cross flow, what is happening with the retrograde circulation through PCOMs. So there are no PCOMs from left or right. So he is likely to land up into problems. So the picture here is not very, very clear, but you can see that the right vertebral is hypoplastic and it is uh, ending in pica and there is some communication with the lower basilar which we don't see very clearly he was moving so not very very clear so this is right v origin and this is the left vertebral shoot which shows that there is occlusion so this is a problematic case that you have to open either a CTO of left vertebral, which will be very difficult and is likely to have high complication rate. And you cannot put a stent in right vertebral basilar junction because right V is very hypoplastic 
and a whole small, small stint, whether uh, it will give a long-term outcome and uh, whether during procedure, this junction will rupture is, uh, is a question mark. So the next indication is progressive TI, that is symptomatic stenosis more than 50% or 70% despite adequate medical management. That is, you have given two standard antiplatelets in standard doses and high dose statin along with low molecular weight heparin if patient has a TI-like presentation and still patient is having recurrent TIs. So this patient, this was, I think, one of the first few stentings that I had done. This uh, gentleman was very obese. He was a hypertensive. And from six, to, six months to a year, he was always complaining of clouding of vision and blurring of vision when he was upright. And these things used to get better within a few minutes or few hours. So he was investigated, but uh, he was not investigated with MRI. Fortunately, I got MR angiogram done. I don't have uh, MR angiogram with me right now because it was done several years ago. So it had shown, it, it showed severe mid basilar stenosis with encorpment uh, of uh, the left pica. So obviously he was stinted and he is doing well, but recognition of the syndrome is very important. The third indication is contralateral occlusion with asymptomatic severe stenosis, more than 50% on ipsilateral side. So this is uh, the V4 segment. The right VA is occluded, pica is feeling retrogradely, and you have severe stenosis. So this is likely to progress, and uh, this needs intervention. Now, when we come to acute stroke, we have a lot of discussions now recently on uh, acute occlusions and at the same time intracranial atherosclerotic disease. The problem with acute stenting is we don't have antiplatelet effect. So unless we have a good antiplatelet effect, complications rate is very, very high. So this is a gentleman who had presented with basilar occlusion with two passes of solitaire the artery had opened, but there was a sidewall thrombus which was giving trouble and the artery was slowing down every 15 minutes after you do solitaire. So I had to put a drug eluting stent and uh, he was fine. So in these patients, you have to give Relenta loading dose along with Ecosprin and for six to eight hours, you have to bridge with tirofibam, which is a very risky in acute stroke. So this gentleman was already on antiplatelets, already on statins, and he was, leave, uh, he was getting full dose of low molecular weight heparin for a week's time, but he continued to have recurrent TIs. So there was no option but doing stenting. So all in all, I feel that uh, economy up to certain extent is very, very important because if you don't have the right material, the complication rate is going to be high. So if you can afford a long sheath like ballast and distal access catheter like at five or uh, maybe on five, then it is easy to access distal part of the artery and get the procedure done successfully. You should also think about what are the comorbidities and life expectancy because uh, the other illnesses may take over. Now, acute stenting versus elective stenting, I feel every patient who has a TIA and who is stable should be given at least one week of antiplatelets before you think of intracranial stenting. So elective stenting is always better unless he's throwing recurrent TIs and is developing new diffusion deficits. 
our complication rate should be less than 0.1% ideally but that can only happen if we select cases properly and it is also important to consider uh, patient and caregiver wish whatever they they have opinion we have to respect it but we have to explain them thoroughly likely consequences and whatever can be done to you in the same situation has to be done to the patient so how to select cases now somebody who has a very focal stenosis has is likely to have a very good outcome so stenosis of less than 5 mm without any perforated disease is likely to have very long term good outcome now location uh whether it is proximal or distal yes it matters if it is proximal access is easy if it is distal the access becomes difficult sometimes but if it is perforator free still a good outcome can be given so the next important concept is what is the mechanism of ti whenever there is a stenosis in the artery with unstable clot there are three mechanisms at work one is perforator disease that is the ostium of perforators is also diseased at the same time so it can give rise to lacunar strokes second clots can form on unstable plaque and through emboli distally that is embolic and third is a hemodynamic component which is very important and which is likely to respond to stenting in a much better way than other two diseases now whether it is single lesion or tandem lesion yes it matters because if you are putting two stents the likely chances of complications are going to increase so he was a young man who was on antiplatelets for several years i had seen him in 2014 and he had come back in 2020 or 21 i don't remember now but he had a very tight mca lesion just before the bifurcation of mca and you can see a lot of tortuous it is proximally in the carotid so you can see the stenosis is very short and it does not involve the bifurcation so you can give a good result in him as long as you can access the artery and go into supraclinoid ica so that your stent can track up so these are various uh, locations of the lesion sometimes you have multifocal lesions this was a patient of stroke who had acute basal occlusion and i had done several solitary passes and after that the artery opened but he had significant stenotic lesions from v4 segment to upper basal artery so i had to do multiple balloon angioplasties and then put a stent this is a standard icm1 stenosis for which we call focal cerebral arteriopathy which is seen very commonly this is a clinoid or supraclinoid segment stenosis severe focal there is no branch arising at this point so long term outcome is good this is a i will say proximal m1 and mid m1 stenosis longish lesion and perforator segments are involved this is a clinoidal and a supraclinoid segment again this is v4 segment this is petrous segment this is petro cavernous junction severe stenosis again outcome should be good because you can put a stent directly and then dilate and this is a v4 segment lesion so again about mechanism as i said a shows distal embolism in end artery zone from the stenotic area this is a perforator disease causing local lacunar infarcts and this is where hemodynamic compromise comes in and this watershed becomes ischemic and uh, this is highly likely to respond to intracranial stenting so obviously you need to uh, 
CDSA, if it is done outside and if it is inadequate, you need to repeat it before the procedure because patient sometimes comes only for carotid stenosis and you miss the M1 stenosis. So if at all this case has to be planned, we have to know that MC also needs to be stented if he's uh, throwing TIS on optimal medical management. So my protocol is for every patient, if DS is done outside, I review DSA. If it is inadequate, inadequate, I plan it again. Check cross flow always. I prefer giving dual antiplatelets at least for seven days if patient is stable. If patient is unstable and developing strokes, there is no choice but to load with double antiplatelets and then plan emergency procedure. Hydration is also very important in patients who are diabetic as uh, they may develop uh, contrast associated nephropathy. And blood pressure should not be lowered at least or kept to above upper limit of normal. This is another hurdle where uh, you may not able to access the distal artery just proximal to the stenosis because of the carotid siphon. So as you can see, as the angle becomes acute and acute, pushing a DAC into this artery becomes difficult. So the Mori classification, I think everybody knows that uh, the short tubular and uh, concentric lesion is uh, easy to tackle and gives good result. While as type B tubular lesions, five to 10 millimeters, angulated and occlusive less than three months has a high chance of complications and type C diffuse lesions more than 10 millimeters angulated very tortuous and occlusive for more than three months are likely to have high complications. So during procedure I have started using IGLs not intubate the patient because intubation and extubation is very comfortable blood pressure fluctuations are very, very less. And there is no irritation of the trachea and cough after extubation. Heparin, we give in standard fashion. We can use femoral or radial, whichever is feasible. You should have a stable platform over the patient's thigh or uh, a sort of uh, stable platform where you can manipulate wires and your catheters. And if anatomy is unclear, always use a 3D array to understand anatomy. Now, <clears throat> whenever we, uh, whenever we navigate in intracranial circulation, we should have the guiding catheter or long sheath, at least up to petrous portion if it is a distal stenosis. So the base camp, whatever we call it as a base camp, most often I use the ballast sheath. Ballast sheath is 088. It can be passed through eight French short sheath and it can be navigated with 125 centimeter diagnostic catheter. So I use more of ballast because uh, ballast is very, very hydrophilic and most likely 90% of the time it will take the petrous bend. Distal axis catheters, I use, uh, I have used Navion more than CAT5, but uh, many of my friends tell me that CAT5 is much, much better. So we'll try to use it. If it is proximal stenosis, you can have only six French uh, routine guiding catheter like NY. This is uh, also one important step that while navigating the long sheath, it is better to have a diagnostic 125 centimeter catheter so that emboli from arch do not enter intracranial circulation because uh, if you put a buddy wire for exchange, sometimes there is a clot formation and emboli may go into intracranial circulation. So I think that is a safer way to do it. So these are uh, the diagnostic catheters that I routinely use, 125 centimeter catheters. 
which is called triple coaxial system for navigating the long sheet. And uh, you can see here that the lumen of uh, CAT5 and the Navion is 058. The minimum required is 056. So if you use a long sheet with five French, say five French neuron, then uh, the stent, which is more than three millimeter may not go up. I'm uh, saying about drug eluting stents. So minimum ID of the distal axis catheter should be 058. Now this is one catheter which is useful with CAT5 navigation. If it is not crossing the siphon, you can use axis offset, which is just a micro catheter. You don't need to cross the lesion, just keep it proximal. And then over it, you can track catalyst five. It has a dilatation in the mid part so that there is a no ledge effect on the distal axis catheter. So any drug eluting third or fourth generation stent can be used for intracranial stenting. So I generally use Synergy or uh, Onyx Resolute stent. Recently, there was a discussion and uh, Gigi sir had, uh, I think, discussed it in forum that which stent is more navigable. So I used a Hyperflex Cruise stent, which is an Indian company, and I feel the navigability of that stent is much better than Synergy or Onyx. Another important thing that whenever you use uh, a distal axis catheter or aspiration catheter in acute stroke, it is a 130 centimeter, whether it is ACE, whether it is SOFIA, whether it is REACT. So you may fall short while uh, tracking the stent. So use always 115 centimeter lens, distal axis catheter, and uh, not aspiration catheters. Microwires, O14 are compatible with stent wires. So I most often use Praxis or run through. Transcend is a little bit stiff wire. So if at all, if you want to use it, keep it proximal, not very distal. Stents, as I mentioned, that I use uh, most often Onyx or Integrity. And uh, now I have recently used Hyperflex Cruise. Now, self-expanding stents, unfortunately, I have not come across situations where uh, I have used self-expanding stents. But uh, I think Credo is promising. But as you know, that the restenosis rate is high with self-expanding stents. So all these drug eluting stents have almost the same price and these are the most commonly used stents. So some procedural uh, techniques that never ever navigate without roadmap when you are going in intracranial circulation and whenever you encounter any resistance to the wire or guiding catheter, don't push it. Base cam should be as distal as possible, but without any pushing. And I have noticed this over years that even if stent doesn't track, if you give intraarterial pneumodipine and just wait for 15 minutes and uh, keep your wire distally, the shape of the wire and the shape of RT changes, anatomy changes, and you can track the stent easily. And while pushing DAC, advancement should always be with wire or microcatheter. Now, uh, these are major hurdles of crossing C1, C2 bend in posterior circulation and ophthalmic in anterior circulation. So the tricks I use are make a J or tight C to the wire and the make a J shape and keep it as distal in the M2 or M3 segment. Use the same wire, which is safest according to you. Sometimes if uh, the distal axis catheter doesn't track, I initially do angioplasty for severe lesions and 
I keep the balloon distally and with just a slight backward pressure on the balloon, I push the distal excess catheter. Most often it process uh, the siphon and ophthalmic vent. So balloon, there are multiple uses of balloon in intracranial stenting. One is you can get accurate assessment of stent size and length which is a real time. It gives idea about navigation. It helps to track the DAC across the bends because it gives support. If it doesn't work, you can use two wires, which is slightly stiffer, but keep it proximally, not very distally, and try giving intraarterial nimodipin and wait for its effect. So, here is uh, one example where uh, Navion was not crossing the ophthalmic bend. So I had kept balloon distally. And you can see in the second uh, video that while pulling the balloon, the distal axis catheter just goes up. This is another case uh, where there was a tandem lesion. The problem was uh, not severe carotid stenosis, but there was a uh, calcified plaque here which was, uh, which was not uh, negotiated with Navion. So you can see the plaque is moving here. So I'm not pushing too hard. I'm just checking what is happening. So wire is going, but because of plaque, the distal axis catheter is not moving. So I had to put a stent initially and then put a balloon inside the stent. And you can see partial inflation of the balloon and my uh, ballast sheet tracks and into the stent and up. So while navigating the stent, again, as I said, you can use nimodipin if it is not crossing. Wait for 15 to 20 minutes and then again try. Use another wire. That is second wire if stent doesn't cross. You can advance the guiding catheter that is long sheet slowly as a full system if nothing else works. Obviously, this is not possible in posterior circulation where vertebral uh, diameter is small and you cannot push a long sheet into the vertebral. Some of my friends have used guideliner catheter, which is a extension of guide and it tracks over the wire in a rapid exchange. So it gives support additionally, along with uh, the guiding catheter. So this is a Navion distal access catheter, and this is a guiding catheter or ballast. And uh, after uh, balloon angioplasty, while pulling back the balloon guiding catheter, it just crossed this bend and went up the ophthalmic. So this still the stent had some problem in the navigating. So you can see here, the movement is very slight of the guiding catheter. You can look at the guiding catheter I'm just pushing the guiding catheter. So immediately the DAC moved up. That caused a little problem. I'll show you later. I'll show, show it to you later. But uh, most, if you push the long sheet, generally the DAC moves up. So this is the stent tracking. Now about stent placement. Measure the size accurately and keep it accurate. Keep the stent's length as short as possible. Undersize, I generally undersize by 0.25 millimeters. There are people who oversize it by 0.25 millimeters, but they don't cross nominal pressure. Avoid as far as possible any branches across the stent. For ICM1 and ICFPCOM, junction stenosis, the problem is anterior choroidal PCOM and ACA all arise from the area, from the, the part of the stenosis. So
so it is very important that during dsa you, you check cross flow that how is the cross flow even if the artery occludes the other ac is filling from the opposite side ec is filling from the basilar etc so when you have a perforated disease obviously in basilar mca the risk of uh, having a lacunar stroke is high because it's like flowing the snow and putting it into some other place so the plaque ruptures and it covers the origin now what i do for stent inflation i literally count 1 2 3 4 allowed so that nominal pressure is not exceeded and once the stent opens i stop i don't uh, inflate any more and make sure that uh, the stent is well opposed to the wall if at all the stent is under inflated you can do plasty with the same balloon i have never used uh, post dilatation but sometimes it may be necessary now once stent is deployed you have to check for proper wall opposition now don't move the balloon proximally because in unlikely event if there is a rupture you can always inflate the balloon and most often what happens once the stent is inflated we invariably take back the balloon and the wire comes out and then it is very difficult to take the wire and balloon again in the stent and you may lose time another important thing is while removing the balloon of stent keep your distal axis catheter low pull it back pull guiding back keep wire little back not very distal because while pulling the balloon out there may be some resistance encountered and your guiding and distal axis catheter may move into stent and wire may perforate so after deployment of stent you wait for 30 minutes take the last shoot after 30 minutes make sure that there is no branch occlusion distally if there is any doubt or if there is any thrombus you can start tirofibrin infusion and wait sometimes you may have to do a balloon angioplasty so make sure that wire is always distal to the stent if you lose access it becomes very difficult to cross sometimes so the torker should be always attached to y connector hub after you complete the case post procedure care is routine there are some problems which are encountered uncommonly but make sure that there is no retention of urine sheath removal after aptt normalizes blood pressure should be kept in normal range check neurological exams for first 24 hours repeatedly and mobilization after 12 hours of femoral axis and uh, this is very important that brilliant uh, aortic agrolor should be given on empty stomach twice daily t half is uh, about 8 to 12 hours so strict monitoring has to be done whether patient takes ticagliru on time and on empty stomach and ecosprin uh, we give it only 75 mg because ecosprin will increase the metabolism of ticagliru so ecosprin 75 mg is recommended so the technical details of intracranial stenting i have finished so let's see few cases and then we can have you and a if necessary is it okay jay hello yes sir okay okay so as i mentioned earlier that this was one of the first cases that i did at lower basilar so you can see the six branch neuron guiding catheter here stent easily balloon and stent easily crossed and uh, this is the stent inflation and uh, he is fine now he is doing well so this is a man with uh, recurrent posterior circulation stroke stenosis doesn't look so tight maybe about 60 to 70% but uh, there is no recurrence now so in posterior circulation it is very important that if one vertebral is occluded 
and the other V4 segment is severely stenosed, the chances of stroke are very high. So, procedure can be done in a routine way. So, this was a software, he was a software engineer. I'll tell you a story that he had just mild slurring of speech and uh, they were so uh, afraid that he traveled immediately to the hospital and we did his MRI. So you can see diffusion. Diffusion does not show any deficit. And uh, when I saw the MR in the evening, it was already reported to be normal. But when I saw it carefully, there was a significant lesion, tight stenosis involving left M1. So we gave him antiplatelets and heparin. We discussed with family about uh, the possibility of occlusion or stroke. So after discussion, family was pro to go ahead with intratinal stenting. So it was done uneventfully. So this is the final shoot. Stent has inflated well and he is doing well. So I have seen many, many patients uh, for last few years who have ICM1 disease and uh, who present with recurrent strokes and TI and uh, they do very well with the uh, intratinal stenting. So this lady was a diabetic and hypertensive. She was about 50 years old and she had recurrent TIs. She was admitted a month ago for stroke was on antiplatelets, was very regular with antiplatelets, still developed a stroke. So again, same thing, you cross the wire, you put a balloon and then put a stent. So this is her MR. You can see diffusion deficits in border zone. There is a very tight M1 stenosis in mid M1. And you can see that she had uh, another diffusion deficits on medical treatment. So these patients uh, do have frequent TIs and uh, they may land up with uh, major stroke. This was a man with uh, language difficulty, again, distal M1 stenosis, again, uh, drug eluting stent. So this man was referred, already diagnosed with, uh, no. So this lady was under treatment for stroke again, and uh, she had another episode. She was started on a low molecular weight heparin. She was given brilliant and equosprin. She was observed, but in hospital, she started worsening. So this is a diffusion which shows tiny dots of border zone, typical. So the problem here was uh, so this is very tight supraclinoid ICS stenosis. She had a very bad art, so had difficulty in navigating, but so this is the base cam, this is the ballast sheet, this is the Navion. With balloon, I could track Navion into the uh, cavernous and uh, ophthalmic bend. And then stent inflation, you can see there is some uh, discrepancy between the distal inflation and the proximal but the wall opposition is good so she did not have any problem so this is the arch which is uh, very bad and now i feel that maybe for such patients radial would be good so this is a balloon angioplasty and uh, this is stent inflation you can see that the stent inflates initially distally the distal part has inflated well but the proximal part has not inflated so well. It may relate to the proximal diameter of the artery. That is discrepancy between proximal and distal. 
but if it is opposed well there is no problem and this is the video just to show that uh, how stent tracks and uh, whenever there is a resistance the distal axis and guiding will go down so this is the p op mr which i had shown and this is the ct she did not have uh, any bleed and she did well so this is a man with high grade basilar stenosis he had uh, occipital infarcts and uh, problems with vision unsteadiness slurring of speech and you can see that the vertebral origin takes a almost 180 degree turn here and there is poor flow above the pica segment there are no collaterals coming from either left or right carotid so this was a emergency case because he was developing tis and uh, he was deteriorating so this is the navigation of uh, the navion and this is a mid basilar stenosis so there are perforators but obviously there is no option here but to put a stent So the stent gave problem because of vasospasm in this part C1 C2, but with nimodipin slowly it tracked. Once it tracked C1 C2 bent, then things are easier. So this is the post procedure, and uh, he is doing very well. So. again icm1 junction disease as i told you that young population and uh, typically it is unilateral involvement and they develop progressive tis so he had some language issues and vision problems and uh, mild right hemiparesis there are significant diffusion lesions here you can see tight stenosis of left icm1 junction so again hey. same thing tracking the stent yeah was this is also interesting case she is a 86 year old on treatment for stroke on uh, dual antiplatelets for several years and then she developed progressive worsening and then was admitted this is a di initial diffusion sequence which shows again embolic as well as border zone infarcts and you can see the tight m1 stenosis she was admitted several years ago for a stroke so i have that mri so you can see that she was admitted for a small lacunar stroke 3 years ago and this was the area of mca which was not severely stenosis but you can see after 2 years despite of antiplatelets and statins she had developed this so uh, as i had mentioned earlier that there was a plaque in the carotid so it was difficult so i had to put a carotid stent to make it straight and then navigate my uh, guiding sheath and then navion and then stent in the m1 and she had become hemiplegic so after stenting she her power surprisingly improved improved i did not i did not expect her to improve so fast but uh, she improved after that so again same disease icm1 hypertensive young patient very tight icm1 stenosis so base cam in a standard fashion balloon angioplasty and uh, as i told you that uh, the stent was not tracking so i had to use force with uh, the guiding catheter that is pallas and then that moved up but at the same time it hit the area of stenosis so you can see the stent is deployed but post stent deployment things got really scary there is m2 and m1 junction occlusion so i gave pirofibane intraarterial 10 cc 
and uh, did a expert CT on table. There was no bleed. So I waited for 15 minutes, but things started getting worse. So I was wondering what to do. Luckily, I had the, uh, the catch mini. So I used a O2-1 catheter, went into that uh, superior branch of MCA, took a micro injection, deployed the stent. And then with the pinching technique, with just partial deployment, to take the clot out and luckily she had hey, she has, uh, no deficits hey, Marisha, and uh, she's fine so typical atherosclerotic young hypertensive supraclinoid IC stenosis and uh, standard treatment is well so this again was a gentleman who was on follow-up for several years. He had right cerebellar impact and uh, pica impact initially, was on antiplatelets. And over a week's time recently, she, he had the worsening, developed a medullary impact and left cerebellar impact. So you can see the only one vertebral is working, the other is occluded. You can see occipital impact here. So he had a direct origin of vertebral from arch. So I just used a neuron six range guiding catheter. If the proximal tortuosity is not an issue, neuron can really track well in distal. But if proximal tortuosity is an issue, neuron won't track, it will come back. So I just use a neuron and then stent crossed well. This was, I think, graft master. And uh, is absolutely well, he has no problems now. So this was a very high risk case because uh, he was a young man who had uh, dilated cardiomyopathy with ejection fraction of less than 25% and had suffered massive pulmonary edema. And after a month's time, he developed left hemiparesis and he was on already uh, antiplatelets including tricagrolar and equisprin. So this was a patristenosis. So I just took a balash sheet, crossed the wire, and then put a stent. Uneventful. So this is the stent opposition. So this is again 76 year old, left vertebral occluded, and right VA more than 50% stenosis. This is Pedro Cavernous Junction stenosis. Again, direct stenting, no balloon here. So this is a very obese lady who had presented with again, first episode of TI with recovery. And this was about a week ago. So after detailed discussion with family, we went ahead with stenting of ICA M1 junction. I told you previously that uh, this is very common in young individuals here. I've seen many cases like this who do really well with stenting. So what I want to show here is you can see that uh, the anterior choroidal and small pecom is arising from the posterior wall as usual. And uh, the ACA, AC origin is also stenosis. I don't, huh. you can see it here. AC origin is severely stenosis. So I did her DSA which showed that the posterior medial choroidal and lateral medial choroidal was seen very well. There was supply to the temporal lobe from the posterior circulation and both PCAs were seen very well. ACA was uh, also feeling from the left side. So you can see post stenting these two arteries, anterior choroidal and PCOM are not seen anymore. So these things can happen. Patient did not have any deficit, but uh, these are things to be considered. And post-stenting, she also had the occlusion of right A1. A ACA was no more seen. Uh, 
Uh, this is her. She is fine, ma. This is after months time. Having she has no deficits. So this is just another. Uh, this is just another case where uh, B4 is severely stenosis and right knee is occluded. So this is just transradial stenting. What I wanted to show you is that. Uh, if let V is dominant, you can directly go through the radial rather than femoral and use a simple neuron catheter. And most often it tracks well. But what happened is tracking of the stent was difficult and uh, he had dissection. So, I don't know why the next slide is not playing. But then I had to put a second stent. Uh, I put, I think, 4 by 25 to cover this, and uh, he was fine. So if you're going by radial, having a support of uh, long sheath, ballast sheath, is very, very important, because uh, pushing may give problems sometimes. So my take home message to, to everybody is uh, you have to select cases properly. You have to use appropriate material, never compromise on material. Stent and balloon should be properly sized with measurements and should not be inflated beyond nominal pressure. Post dilatation most often is not required. We should always wait for 30 minutes to look for stent associated thrombosis. Newer and newer materials are more likely to increase success rate and long term outcome and minimize complication rate. Now, the SOFIA 5 and SOFIA 6 distal axis catheters, according to uh, many of the colleagues, seem to be very trackable more than uh, even CAT and uh, Navion. So, intratenial stenting has a definite role in prevention of recurrent strokes in patients with high-grade stenosis with infarct-related artery, and proper selection of cases is very important, and it is a very feasible option. So, my thanks to all of you for patient listening. I hope uh, it was not very boring lecture. Uh, I intentionally avoided uh, all the literature and uh, the percentages and uh, the control trials because I was given topic of how to do it. I hope you liked it uh, and thank you very much. Hello. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Or if anyone is having any doubt, you can ask right now. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, this is Dr. Subair from Mumbai, BCH, uh, Breach Candy Hospital. Uh, sir, uh, can you throw light on uh, the standing in uh, children, uh, especially uh, young, young patients uh, less than 15 uh, years of age, especially keeping in mind the other syndromes like Moya Moya, when uh, yeah. that kind so, of... Moya Moya... moya we don't uh, yeah so uh, what as a neurologist what uh, i have experienced i will tell you in children atherosclerosis is distinctly uncommon that is one part dissections are very very common in children so we follow the standard instructions for dissections like uh, you initially manage them on medical management and if they are stable we don't intervene but if they continue to have TIS and have high likelihood of having a stroke, then putting a stent is a feasible option, but I think uh, it will be very, very rare. Second is uh, many patients, uh, many children have para-infectious syndrome of vasculitis with varicella or herpes. So many a times these stenotic lesions 
are really vasculitis so there is no point treating them with stents in fact you may have to give them steroids or immunosuppression so i have not had any patient who was less than 15 years old in whom i had done stenting so i really don't know but dissections yes definitely there are patients who have inherited disorders and children are likely to have dissections and patients who are resistant on medical management yes they may require stent thank you thank you sir sir uh, one message uh, is regarding uh, the recent the chinese stenting uh, trial which has yeah. shown uh, very less uh, no advantage of stenting uh, yeah. so maybe uh, so, yeah, yeah. So, that is a very old topic but uh, as far as i remember sampris trial had not given adequate antiplatelets to the patients sometimes uh, stenting was done on the second or third day that is the first second there were no experienced operators many novice people had done these procedures third the waste and standing stent which is called wing span so wing span is basically you take a micro catheter and micro wire cross the lesion and then you come with the stent and deploy it across the stenosis you may pre or post dilate so there was a double exchange involved you i think all of you must be knowing double exchange that you take the micro catheter exchange with the wire stiffer wire and then you track the stent across so double exchange is a maneuver which is uh, highly risky and wire perforations were very high in sampris trial i think one of the reasons for that is uh, double exchange and fifth part i think the case selection the osteal disease that we see in perforators was not considered in sampris trial so i think uh, uh, there are patients in intracranial disease where stenting is very risky when if you put a balloon mounted or i mean regulating stent or a self expanding stent so it is better to avoid stenting in these people and uh, catch the sub group of patients who are likely to do well i mean we don't have a material for perforated disease at present we don't have dedicated material so we have to choose your cases properly so i think that is the main reason why sampri trial failed anything good evening sir uh, i am dr fazal from rajagiri hospital cochin Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, I mean, uh, in M1 occlusions, uh, after how many passes do you decide whether we need to stent the M1? Because I mean, most of the times you see in atherosclerotic lesions after repeated passes, even after six, seven passes, if the yeah. vessel is occluding, when do you really, in, a, in an acute setting, when do you yeah. really decide to stent the uh, MCA? Okay. So. from 2012 to 2022 my take about this is slowly changing initially i used to do five passes and wait again for 15 minutes and by the time artery closes opens closes opens there is a significant ischemic damage to the brain so now from 2020 i have changed i if i see a stenotic lesion uh which is opened by first or second pass of solid maybe two passes i do expert ct make sure that there is no bleed if stenting is really a difficult choice suppose a patient is very elderly has multiple lacunes if you want to avoid stenting you can just do a plasty and wait for 30 minutes if it starts closing then we have to do a stent so my threshold for stenting is reduced so after two passes if artery starts closing you have to put a stent and make sure that you do a expert ct pre post procedure 
and if it is required twice also you have to do it because you have to make sure that there is no bleed many a times when patients come in acute stroke many of them are not on antiplatelets so when they come to emergency and we make a diagnosis of m1 occlusion or basilar occlusion we immediately give uh, ecosprin or plavix loading doses or prilenta and ecosprin so by the time you take them for intervention within an hour there is some antiplatelet effect i remember recently in one of the cases a uh, patient had a gastric ulcer so giving them anti giving him antiplatelet was also difficult so we had used cangrelo in him there is a iv antiplatelet now available the problem with stenting is stent occlusion if you don't have a antiplatelet effect the stent will occlude so we have to make sure that adequate antiplatelet effect is achieved and at the same time there is no bleed in the brain so brilenta takes effects by 1 hour generally but it takes about 6 to 10 hours for complete action so you can also breeze them with pirofibar so my answer would be stenting threshold has reduced maybe two passes and if the artery is closing you can do angioplasty or go ahead with stenting thank you sir uh, as i noticed you are giving lot of emphasis to uh, pre and post uh, i mean to do an expert ct but yeah. most of the time sometimes uh, in setup that we are going to work maybe in the expert ct might not be available in those kind of situations and second if at all we are already lysing the patient is antiplatelet still necessary of course even if you lyse the patient antiplatelets have to be given i had a case yesterday where a young boy had a huge cca thrombus and mc occlusion so i had to first take the clot from cc out and then go with guiding and i use sofia so mc opened easily but then i had to put a stent so he was thrombolyzed from outside he had come within an hour in another hospital so because of no improvement and relatives uh, were panicky they came here so he was already thrombolyzed so yeah. i had to give antiplatelets but i think from i completed the procedure at 11 at night and from 11 to 7 o'clock i did three cts just to be sure that there is no bleed because if it happens it is a disaster these things are not under your control but if you put a stent you have to have antiplatelet effect so i also gave him tirofibar so this is uh, i mean it is out of guidelines yes sir any 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 uh, anything to do if at all you don't have a ct setup within your expert ct within the cath labs oh, it's tough because you cannot clinically assess the patient right yeah. is under g most often so very tough decision to make i don't have an answer for it no you have to have a ct and thank you sir thank you sir uh, one doubt sir actually sir if uh, uh, this coronary stents if we have significant trackability issue uh, for yeah. example both the balloon and the stent won't be reaching the region or after the balloon reaches and already we have done the angioplasty sometimes yeah. the stent won't go there yeah. and in that case uh, what are the option uh, can we use the uh, neuro stents that is a question and in neuro stents also some stents uh, uh, are there uh, for intracranial atherosclerosis is like uh, credo type of yeah. stent and yeah. previously actually we have used uh, like co co uh, this cotman enterprise and all for yeah. Yeah. sending which have very less radial force so yeah. what is your experience on that sir okay so for last 10 years i have not used a single cell expanding stent maybe situation did not come to me there are situations where you would use self expanding stent just to tide over the crisis so if you see that there is a very tight bend in the ophthalmic and the stent is not tracking you can use a self expanding stent but at the same time you also need to know that long term results of self expanding stent is not good there is going to be restenosis at a later time so 
that's what I explained that if the stent is not trackable or balloon is not trackable, what are the steps that you are going to use? First is your base cam. The ballast should be at the petrous bend at least. And 90% of the times it will go unless it is very tortuous. Second, Navion 5 French distal access catheter or CAT5 are very good distal access catheters. So they easily take ophthalmic bend if it is MCS stenosis. So if the distal access catheter is just proximal to the stenotic lesion, there is no problem in tracking the stent. Okay. So once you track the stent into the stenosis, dilating it and opposing it to the wall is not so difficult. The, the most difficult part is tracking. And I think in 95% of the uh, cases, it should be possible. I mean, you can anticipate that this is a difficult anatomy and stent may not track. So you may not choose the case, but if anatomy is relatively straightforward, most often it will go. And I heard from uh, the company representative that the Sophia Plus is the new uh, aspiration catheter. So they have uh, also made Sophia 5 and Sophia 6, which is only for distal access. Their length is 115. So he said that they are as trackable as Sophia Plus. So if that happens, if our distal catheter easily goes into MCA even without a wire, then tracking the stent won't be difficult. The other issue is we are using cardiac stents that we have to agree. We don't have a dedicated material as yet for neuro. So we can have flexible stents for particularly neuro intervention, which have a drug eluting property. So somebody has to design it. And uh, the other aspect that I told you that uh, recently uh, there was a discussion on forum in Spro group. I was, uh, my attention went to it because I had this problem. I was you know, using synergy stents, which is four generation drug eluting stent, just like Onyx. But uh, the trackability was not so good. So somebody said that, uh, I think uh, Gigi sir only had written that how is the truth stent? So I called up the company man from SMC and he said that there is significant uh, good trackability as compared to other stents. So I, I have used it in three cases and it just uh, goes even with guiding at the petrus, even if it is MCA. So I, I find it very trackable. So maybe because the stent strut size of uh, cruise is 60 micrometers, it is the smallest as compared to any other stents in the world. But long-term data, I don't know. So if at all you want to use a trackable stent, I think uh, if your stent, routine stent onyx is not tracking, you can use cruise. And uh, about self-expanding stents, uh, I have seen the, uh, I have seen many people doing self-expanding stents, but if you see the post-procedure pictures, you can already see that this stenosis is not completely gone. The stenosis is not treated completely. So no surprise that it will come back. Yes, yes, sir. So obviously that is a problem. So we have to design stents for neuro. Now, who does it? Anything, anything more questions? Oh, sorry, and there is other, no... okay. ah, tell, sir. The other aspect uh, that I want to uh, make it clear to everybody of you, especially the students that in acute stroke, we often use aspiration catheters, right? So if you use 130 centimeters and if you find that there is ICD, you have to take it back and take a new distal access catheter. So rather than using an aspiration catheter, you can use Navion or you can use, uh, uh, say, CAT5, 
which are 115 centimeters. Anyway, they track to mid basilar in posterior circulation or, or uh, the M1 segment in anterior circulation. So you can do stenting as well with those catheters. So it becomes easy. The procedure becomes short. 